so um, wonderful to get on get on the call with us now. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Sarah Rogers. I have the honor of being the director of the Kent State University Museum. And you're really in for a special treat tonight. This evening, we return to a series of talks made possible by the Jean Druzado Endowed Fund for Costume and Textile Conservation, which is sponsored by Christopher P. Sullivan, MD. And in fact, both Jean and Chris are on the call. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you um, to both of you. As Jean, I like to say, um, Jean, who many of you know is the KSU esteemed uh, former director of the museum. And I like to say she really built this remarkable collection over 25 years, one pair of shoes, one corset, one day dress, one sari and one ball gown at a time. And she did it uh, with many others helping, but it's really been her vision. So we're so pleased to honor her legacy and her scholarship in this way and our deep thanks to Chris, um, for the idea of allowing us to have a special talk um, focused on textiles and conservation. Howard Sutcliffe is an old friend of the museum. He's assisted us with other issues with our collection, um, a Jeffrey Bean garment we were just talking about. Um, and more recently, several Chanel gowns, Coco Chanel in our collection that are now part of the exhibition on view Forever Chanel, Coco plus Carl. Some of you might be wondering, what is a textile conservator? Well, you'll be learning more about that this evening. I like to think of the, them as part scientist, part detective, part artist, and other parts alchemist. I find I am just in awe. I'm a real fan girl of <laughs> uh, especially textile conservators. Howard received his MA in Museum and Gallery Management from the School of Cultural Policy, City, of, City University of London, and then his postgrad diploma in textile conservation from the Textile Conservation Center, Hampton Court Palace, in affiliation with the incredible Courtauld Institute of Art and University of London. His BA in Design of Constructed Textiles is from Duncan Georgestone College of Art, which is at the University of Dundee in Scotland. Howard is now the principal conservator and director of River Region Costume and Textile Conservation. Uh, it's a private practice and he lives in a very beautiful place in um, Arley, Alabama. His clients are all over the globe um, and include from the High Museum to the Detroit Institute of Art where um, he, he's, he has worked previously to us, the Biltmore Estate uh, and really the, and the Metropolitan of Art and really all over the globe. Highly, highly regarded and has incredible experiences. I'd remind you to keep your mics off and videos off, thank you. But we're hoping to have time for questions at the end. So if you have a question, um, you can plunk it in in the chat and then we'll get to those at the end of Howard's talk. So without further ado, Howard, welcome. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. It's lovely to, uh, to join you all. And um, I will uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen. So hopefully we see this. Share. There we go. Great, well, Sarah, thank you for inviting me um, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what I do. Um, I'm gonna talk um, to begin with about the, the two Chanel ensembles that uh, I worked on for the museum. And then I'm gonna move on to a couple of other projects, uh, recent projects that um, will uh, hopefully kind of give you an idea of um, just some of the uh, some of the strange things that uh, we get up to as as textile conservators. So let me move on. So it was a real thrill, and I uh, actually I have to admit that I couldn't really remember um, when I worked on the two Chanel pieces. I had to um, kind of go back 
through all my photographs to see when they were loaded into uh, my computer. So, cause it's been a couple of years at this point. Um, and so I worked on these back in uh, February of, um, I think it was very early um, 2020. Yeah, very early. Yeah. yeah, very, very early. Things were still reasonably normal. So this was kind of one of the last normal projects that I worked on, I think. Um, so this is the first, uh, the first of the two Chanel ensembles. Um, and I'm really, so blouse and skirt, I really only for this one treated the blouse. Um, so I haven't included photos of the skirt just for brevity. Um, but we'll see the skirt in the final shot at the end. Um, but this was an absolutely lovely um, black silk velvet um, ensemble that had um, uh, very, very lightweight uh, linen, um, kind of like handkerchief linen, uh, collars and cuffs. And the black silk velvet was in great shape. I think there was maybe just kind of one or two little holes that needed uh, some attention. But the main point of um, focus with this treatment was the, the collars and cuffs, which as you can see here from the photos of uh, the collar before treatment, um, had a lot of uh, just kind of waterborne staining. So um, not necessarily that it had gotten wet at any point, but um, there was just kind of uh, a lot of, uh, Staining from kind of like being um, maybe in humid environments and uh, water had moved around by capillary action. There's maybe some, you know, sweat in there as well. Um, and this combined with uh, when kind of uh, cellulosic and bast fibers start to break down, one of those um, chemical uh, side products is an aldehyde group, which is uh, yellow. So that's why, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, old tablecloths and things like that will kind of like just kind of yellow um, in your drawers and things like that. So, um, so you can see here, very tight little tide lines, very dark orange in comparison to the linen. Um, I was a little concerned because uh, sometimes, you know, this kind of staining reacts well to cleaning, sometimes it doesn't. Um, if you have those very, very tight tide lines, uh, more often than not, it doesn't. But uh, we will we'll work through this. And um, here are some photos of the cuffs. And again, you can see um, Tight little uh, orange tide lines, some more amorphous uh, staining down on that bottom image. And really when you have that sort of uh, waterborne staining, uh, you are then looking at cleaning it using uh, uh, water, basically aqueous uh, cleaning. And there are a number of different applications uh, that we can uh, do that through. And um, so part of, part of the project obviously is kind of working through, um, can those stains be removed? And then what is the best method of, of application? And so in this slide, um, I'm showing you, in the next few slides, I'm going to show you um, a few different projects that uh, show different applications of cleaning with water. And so this first one is full immersion. And this is a banner uh, as well, a small pendant from um, that belonged to a private client uh, in Detroit. And um, the lady's name is Edith Lee Payne, and her parents took her to the March on Washington. And she was photographed and was uh, put on the cover of Life magazine. And so um, a number of years ago, uh, she sought me out when I was working at the DIA up in Detroit. Uh, the BBC was making um, a documentary about her. And so she, she had found this, uh, this little pennant in her basement and uh, wanted to get it conserved. And um, 
So the, uh, the staining there was very, very acidic, as you can see, that dark brown stain. Um, and thankfully, it was also very, very soluble in water. So this I was just able to kind of like immerse in several baths of water. And you can see there in the, in the bottom right, the very dramatic results of just the stain kind of lifting out of the textile. So it doesn't happen often, but um, it's kind of, it's nice when it does. Um, and then uh, after everything was dried, the, the, the pennant got kind of mounted up and uh, it's now in the National Museum for African-American History in DC. So another option um, is spot cleaning. And here we're looking at a, uh, white, well, ivory uh, silk crepe dress by uh, Jacques Worth uh, that belonged to um, the Duchess of Windsor, um, Wallace Simpson. And um, this again is part of a private collection. Um, it was shown at uh, an exhibition, um, I guess kind of in the early 2000s, and then it uh, was put back into storage um, and then it was requested again for a show in Madrid and taken out of storage. And it had gone through several um, Michigan uh, summer and winter cycles where the humidity went up and down and um, dirt uh, in the dirt and kind of uh, degradation products in the silk had basically moved through capillary action um, to form these orange lines running through the dress. And so with this, I'm using uh, vacuum suction basically um, to uh, draw the, the staining. Uh, I'm basically, I'm applying water to the dress. Uh, the vacuum uh, pulls the water through the silk and also takes with it the stain. And uh, it's very, very effective um, in the right circumstances, just like the aqueous treatment that we just saw, the immersion treatment. And then another option for uh, uh, applying water um, is using a gel. And um, I actually just finished working on this Indian shawl um, last week. This was part of a mold uh, remediation project that I worked on. Um, uh, for the Tuskegee Institute um, in uh, Alabama, down by uh, Montgomery. Um, this is part of the collection of uh, just the things that Booker T. Washington had in his house. Um, and it had uh, quite a lot of mold growth on it, which was cleaned. And then it had also gotten uh, quite wet at one point. And you can see that the orange dye uh, there was quite fugitive. and. Um, so gels are really, really great at targeted cleaning. And so I was able to, um, this is a, an agarose gel. So it's agarose just mixed with uh, the ionized water. Um, the gel is cooked, allowed to cool, and then uh, placed on there. Um, pretty much I, I left these really overnight. And um, the image there on the right, you can see that, um, the gel really just sucks up all that dye and uh, cleans, the, cleans the textile very well. So those are all different applications, um, none of which were right for the Chanel piece. So um, unfortunately, the, uh, the black silk were proved to be very, very uh, fugitive in water. So doing any sort of immersion cleaning was kind of out. Also with the silk uh, that would not have been, um, the silk velvet that would not have been an ideal uh, way to clean it anyway. Um, the, uh, the linen was quite um, thick. So um, the gels wouldn't really have worked. I, I did test them, but didn't get enough kind of penetration of the water to really do any sort of effective cleaning. Um, and then the same thing really with the, with the spot treatment using the, the little suction disc. I just kind of um, couldn't get the right amount of access that I needed. And so I ended up using a technique that has become known as puddle cleaning. 
So here in the slide on the uh, on the left there, you can see that I have uh, placed a, a glass sheet underneath the collar to isolate it from uh, the black silk. And I'm basically just flooding the area that I'm wanting to clean with the ionized water. Um, you can see the same thing on the slide uh, on the right, just kind of the, uh, the linen is wetted out. All the time kind of really making sure that I am not uh, allowing the water to travel into the black silk and cause any dye movement. Um, so I'm really just kind of hovering over the piece and uh, staying on top of it. Um, I then applied a little bit of Orvis foam. So Orvis is a uh, surfactant that is used in um, textile conservation uh, quite frequently. It's a very pure uh, cleaning product that doesn't have um, things like optical brighteners and perfumes and things that the stuff that we buy in supermarkets does. So um, the foam almost acts as a poultice and that is left in place on top of the, the wetted out textile for about 15 minutes. And so the actions of the bubbles just kind of like breaking apart um, actually helps to draw the stain out of the textile. And then after that, there is copious blotting, which you can see happening on the right there. And then here we have just kind of like an overall um, shot of the collar. It's worked on section by section, so I'm not getting it completely wet all at once. Um, and then on the right, you start to see kind of like just the stain that I'm able to kind of like pull out of the, uh, of the linen there. It's quite yellow. And uh, after that, I then go back and kind of copiously just rinse the little section uh, several times over, section at a time just to kind of get rid of the, uh, the surfactants. And here we are just uh, starting to dry um, the, uh, the collar out. Um, it was kind of tricky because uh, if this was a nice flat textile, I would apply a uh, cotton sheet over the top, a drying cloth, because that helps to um, draw out any further dirt, uh, again, by capillary action as the textile dries. Um, but with such a 3D form, that was uh, not really possible. So I laid it up as much as possible using blotting paper and things like that. And then here we are just repeating the process on the cuffs just kind of like a smaller, basically the same protocol, just on a, a slightly smaller scale. Oh, I went too far. And here we go. Here is the, uh, the piece after cleaning and you can see, and after drying, and you can see certainly in comparison to the before shots that the, the color is uh, much less orange now. Um, I was actually surprised at how much, um, just kind of gunk and staining I was able to get out of it. Um, and so it brightened up uh, really, really well. And there we see the piece installed in the show uh, on, the, uh, on the left there. So much brighter. And then we will move on to the second Chanel piece, this uh, fantastic, um, classic Chanel um, suit, basically. So here we see uh, the jacket and um, it is a, a silk, satin, uh, silk satin brocade. Um, I think here we have just kind of like a close up of uh, the weave structure and the pattern. And I think it's a hunting scene from, uh, from what I remember, kind of lots of little chaps on horseback running around the place. Um, and so you see there that the, 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 uh, the warp is the silk, and then there's a lot of silk in the weft, but you also have uh, these uh, flat lorex threads. And there we have the, uh, the skirt front and back before treatment. 
And it was interesting, you can see certainly on the back there along that uh, seam where there's areas where the, uh, the skirt was let out and along the top as well. So here we have uh, three shots that just show uh, the damage that was kind of typical. Um, and this was uh, really throughout the jacket and throughout the skirt as well. Um, so you have kind of like the very, very fine uh, silk warps, which are uh, much more fragile than those heavier uh, lorex wefts. And so uh, there was a lot of areas where um, the fabric had basically just kind of uh, weakened and broken apart. And so you had a lot of warp loss and there you can just see the weft floats in place. Um, uh, in a number of places, uh, the damage had been uh, supported somewhat. There was um, patches of uh, silk repeline just kind of tacked over the surface, which is what you see on that uh, central image there. Um, the, uh, the kind of slightly more opaque area in the center there is uh, crepeline just holding everything together. And then there were areas where uh, there was basically just darning stitches um, that were darned through to the lining. Um, and that's what you see on the, the right hand side. So there was also um, a small little stain on the jacket. Um, which I had some success in uh, reducing. Um, basically, again, very similar technique to what I used uh, with the, uh, the black ensemble. Um, just kind of uh, glass underneath and then very, very carefully just kind of tamping the stain with, uh, with deionized water to get it to release. Um, and it released to a certain point and then nothing else uh, came out of it. So it's always better to uh, end up with a, a slightly lesser stain than a hole or something worse like that. So um, it's a very, it was a very small stain. So it was uh, not, you know, not hugely noticeable anyway. So really with uh, this one, um, the, uh, the focus of treatment was uh, structural support, basically, um, securing all of that damage and just making sure that uh, it doesn't get uh, any worse. And so treatment really started um, once, uh, once the piece had been surface cleaned um, using low powered uh, vacuum suction, um, I then went ahead and just uh, removed all of the, the old repairs very, very carefully, just snipping away um, the, uh, the silk crepeline and then with the darn, uh, darned areas, just kind of uh, clipping those stitches and then gently pulling them um, out to, uh, to release the floats. And then um, here we have uh, the, uh, the support process uh, that's going on. And so you can see uh, on the left, um, I am inserting uh, an underlay patch behind the damage. And so the, the patch material is, uh, uh, I think for this, I used a silk taffeta um, that has kind of like a, you know, a nice um, structure to it, takes dye very well. Because unfortunately, um, most of the time, you can't just walk into a fabric store and find what you need for a project. Um, so a lot of the time, we're having to, uh, to dye fabrics to match. Um, and so certainly the case uh, with, with both of the fabrics that I used here. So the silk is dyed to match. The silk patch is inserted behind the damage. Um, Obviously the, the jacket was lined and so there was no access uh, from the back. So I had to slide the, uh, the patch in from the front um, and then gently just kind of like make sure everything was aligned and arranged nicely using tweezers to get it into place. And then for most of these, I then used an overlay layer, which um, is a really, really fine nylon bobbinet, and I have some working about over here. Uh, actually over here. So this is um, a really fine 
net, you can basically barely see me. You can see kind of right there, kind of across my uh, forehead there. So um, this is made by a, a company in the UK um, using original 19th century machines that would have been used to make silk uh, stockings. Now they're making a nylon net and various other nets. It's a big net company, but they have um, this great conservation uh, net and it takes color very, very well. So you can dye it to match uh, pretty much everything. And so with the silk underneath, the net on top, you're creating kind of like a little sandwich. And uh, you can see the nets in place on that slide on your right. And then I'm pinning the layers together. And then they are basically uh, stitched uh, to secure using lines of laid thread couching. And um, for stitching, I use this material. I should have gotten all this by my desk together. This is a, a material called a stable tex, which is a polyester crepeline. And I basically pull threads out of the crepeline um, and use those uh, for stitching. So very, very fine materials. And then in this sequence, you can see basically the process uh, from beginning really to uh, to the end uh, along the hemline of there you have the uh, the damage um, the damaged area with the darning that is then removed in the center slide and then in the slide on the right I am uh, applying the nylon net and then in this slide you can see two areas of damage um, there is one um, in the bottom left corner that um, is fully supported with the net on top. And then you see on the other side um, where the loose floats are, that that is an area that I have uh, yet to work on. And here we have the jacket um, after treatment. So there was, there was quite a lot of areas. There was more, certainly a lot more areas on the jacket um, that had damage and you would expect that because that's getting a lot more movement um, and has a lot more pressure points in the collar and the cuffs and things like that than the skirt does. And here's uh, two slides that show damage on the, uh, the sleeve, um, obviously before there on the left and then the same area on the right uh, after everything has been supported. And then here we have the, uh, the skirt front and back after treatment. And there she is on the, the right hand side uh, of the screen in, in the show. So I am gonna move on now to a couple of other projects just to round things out a little bit. Um, and I really only realized kind of that they're both Russian um, kind of earlier today. It was like, oh, yeah. Um, so we go from we go from France to Russia basically now. Um, and so I worked on an exhibition uh, for the Georgia Museum of Art in Athens. Um, it's always uh, it's always interesting how things end up uh, in the places that they end up, but they actually have a large collection of um, objects from uh, the imperial family, particularly uh, Tsar Nicholas. Um, and uh, I think uh, these, the, uh, the family that everything belonged to, um, you know, saw the writing on the wall, got out of uh, St. Petersburg, uh, through Finland into London, and then eventually, um, one of the family members ended up teaching at uh, the University of Georgia soon after um, the, the founding of the museum and so uh, the, uh, of the university. And uh, so all of this ended up in, uh, in Athens, Georgia, um, including the uh, uh, coronation outfits, uh, the coronation uniform that Nicholas II wore and um, the amazing, um, uh lord chamberlain's um uniform there that you see in the the foreground of the uh, the slide in the top um left 
Um, also, a number of pieces uh, that belong to the Tsarevich Alexei, which are in uh, little fancy dress outfits that he wore um, in the uh, bottom right slide there, you see the little uh, Cossack outfit and um, the, uh, the fake bullets are made out of uh, that line his chest are made out of bamboo pieces uh, with platinum and uh, sapphire um, ends there. So my uh, my insurance agent uh, was uh, was not too happy that I had those uh, laying around in the studio for uh, for quite a while. Um, but incredible pieces to work on. Um, and the one that I'm really going to focus on today was that hat that you can see there in the, uh, the photo in the top left. So this was the uh, Lord Chamberlain's hat. And um, I wrote down his name uh, earlier on to remind me because it's long. So Nicholas had uh, several Lord Chamberlains. Uh, this one belonged to Prince Alexander Sergeyevich uh, Dolgorokov. And he was a cousin, I think, um, of Nicholas II. And um, the hat, incredible. I mean, just covered in uh, gold work, um, very, very high quality um, gilt and silver gilt, um, embroidered uh, metal threads um, and paillettes and metal plates, all sorts of, you know, just embroidered decoration going on over the top of a very heavy um, leather base and then the crown is uh fold uh kind of felted fold wool um and then the uh the main thing the main condition issue that this had was that uh the ostrich plume decoration had provided uh, quite a feast for carpet beetles so most of that uh was missing and so treatment really started off uh with cleaning and um, there are a number of chemicals that are great at cleaning metal threads. Um, most of them are not great for the stuff that metal threads are generally attached to. So textiles and other organic materials like the leather. And so in this case, I found that actually just kind of um, simple swab cleaning using uh, clean saliva uh, worked really, really well at just kind of lifting um, dirt off of the, uh, the metal. And uh, just the, the gentle action of uh, wiping the swab against uh, the threads um, also uh, helped to really remove kind of like the, uh, the small amount of tarnish that was, that was there. Um, and so once the saliva cleaning has been carried out, I then went over everything with um, ethanol, swabbed ethanol over it, um, just to make sure that it was uh, super clean. And then um, the hat really had uh, quite a bad area of damage. Uh, the, I mean, the leather was really dry overall. Um, and so one side um, had just kind of like cracked around the very heavy embroidery. And so um, I uh, actually made a little insert um, to uh, go in there and support the, uh, the damage. And so that's what you see on the, the top right there. And so the insert is made up of a number of layers of uh, cotton flannel, um, and they are wrapped in uh, a heavyweight Japanese tissue paper that's been tinted to match. And so this insert kind of like sits in um, the, uh, the fold that is, uh, that is cracked and damaged. And then uh, the leather is uh, secured to that insert using uh, archival adhesive. Um, in this case, it was a beaver, so it was a, um, a, a thermoplastic um, acrylic adhesive. Um, and that was secured. Um, and then I started to infill the cracks using a much finer uh, Japanese tissue paper that was secured using a, a cellulose um, adhesive, and that was also then tinted to match. But the, uh, the showiest piece of the, the treatment by far was kind of recreating the, uh, the feather trim. And um, in the original, 
uh, each individual uh, ostrich feather plumule um, had been stitched into um, a silk uh, ribbon, basically. And um, worked great, would have taken kind of uh, you know, a, a lot of time to reproduce that. Fortunately, uh, we now have Amazon. And so a quick search um, found that I can actually buy uh, ostrich feather trim. And um, so half of the work was kind of like done for me. Um, I did find once I got this that the, um, the feathers are actually uh, glued into this uh, ribbon. And I had the adhesive tested um, by uh, <coughs> Christina Basalka, who's the conservation scientist at um, the DIA. And um, it's, it's basically just a PVA adhesive, nothing too terrible, but I was actually um, able to, it's stitched along the top. So I was able to cut it down uh, really, really close to the, to the, um, to the stitching, um, the row of stitching. And so it really removed most of the adhesive. I was then able to just then kind of tack over, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a black silk ribbon over that. Um, and then the ribbon itself uh, was tacked into um, the hat. And um, on the uh, on the left hand side there, um, so my my mother was very proud. Uh, she used to be the the head of um, hair and makeup for BBC Drama um, up in Manchester. And uh, so years ago, I think on one of her first visits, once I moved to the United States. Um, she uh, bought kind of just this cheap kind of pair of curling tiles that she kind of like left here. And so um, she, was, she was pretty impressed that I was able to kind of use those to uh, achieve the gently, uh, you know, tousled look uh, that we were going for with the, uh, with the feathers. So here is the, the final slide. Um, Feathers are in place. Uh, obviously, you can see there that I also made a mount for it. So it has um, an FFO mount, basically, that uh, uh, supports the crown very, very nicely. Um, so archival foam covered in uh, 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 polyester needle punched felt and then the exhibition fabric. And then it also has this handling board so that um, Great for storage. You don't really have to kind of handle the, the hat too much going forward. Um, and uh, there we go. I think it, it turned out pretty well. And then I see where we're getting on for time. So the final thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, from uh, a project from earlier this year, um, the, the Cape from Hell, as I call it. So this um, uh, is a cape that uh, belonged to uh, Marjorie Merriweather Post. Um, so this is from Hillwood in DC, and um, it's actually on display right now in the Roaring uh, 20s exhibit. And um, so this, this had been stored in a trunk for a number of years, and it got wet, very wet. So it was incredibly damaged. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm good friends with the, the director of the museum and um, had never really done work for them before because, you know, we go on vacation and stuff like that. And then um, another conservator actually had this and then just decided that they didn't want to treat it. Uh, they probably had a lot more sense than I do. Um, so anyway, I, I uh, agreed to kind of like take a look at the, uh, the Cape. And um, so it got shipped down to down uh, here to me. And um, uh, of course, as always happens with these things, there's just kind of like a ton more damage than you're expecting. And um, this uh, was just incredibly crispy. Um, so the silk um, had been weighted. And um, so basically, uh, uh, part of the process of kind of like creating the silk, the, uh, the cocoons are boiled um, and the gum that uh, holds the filament thread in place um, dissolves. And so silk is sold by weight. And so, um, you know, obviously the, the merchants were losing a lot of that uh, 
weight that they sold it by when the gum disappears. And so they would actually then soak um, the, uh, the silk threads in uh, heavy metal solutions um, like tin and chromium and things like that uh, to impart the weight back. None of those things are great for the silk threads. And so you get this very characteristic kind of shattering pattern where it looks basically like broken glass. Uh, the silk just kind of starts to break up and um, it's very, very difficult to deal with. So here we have the, uh, the cake before. Here we have some photos that really just show that uh, the level of degradation that's going on, just kind of very, very large splits um, all the way through it. I mean, there, there, was not a, there was not an area of the cake that was not affected by this. Um, apart from the lining, the lining actually was in great condition. Um, it had these fantastic kind of what I called wings. Um, huge. These things were kind of like six feet uh, long, gathered um, along the top uh, to make them kind of half that size. Um, very, I mean, almost like decorative sleeves, basically. Um, and they were kind of pieced together um, with uh, a number of different kind of uh, silk um, taffetas and satins and things like that. And then you had all these uh, little uh, uh, silvered uh, bugle uh, beads all over it. I should say, I forgot to say at the beginning of this, that this was designed, um, it was made by Thurn, which was a, uh, a New York um, department store. And they think that the designer was uh, Natalia Goncharova, who was uh, kind of very well known for designing for the Ballet Russe. So the first thing that I did kind of was a very, very, very gentle surface cleaning uh, using kind of low powered vacuum suction. And then really uh, it was humidifying. And um, for this, uh, I actually kind of created a, a little makeshift tent uh, here in the studio. Um, built up the sides, added little pots of water, covered everything with plastic. And um, I actually left to go to Beaufort, South Carolina for a week uh, for another project. And so I just left it kind of um, uh, humidifying away and uh, it actually did a pretty good job. So when I got back, um, the fibers had, uh, uh, you know, water, um, had uh, entered the fibers, they were a little bit more supple. I was able to move it around a little bit more easily and uh, you know, start the treatment proper. And um, in the center there, you can see this is uh, Gore-Tex. And so because I was able to uh, open it out more fully, I was then able to do more um, targeted um, humidification. And so uh, for that, I was using this material Gore-Tex, which is the kind of stuff that we find in our coats, winter coats. Um, and so it's a semi-permeable membrane. Um, so it has the, the felty side, which I can just spray with water. And then um, there's a smooth side underneath that that goes against the textile. Um, and it's just a very gentle way of introducing more, uh, more water into the fibers. And um, Marjorie had obviously had a pretty good time in this thing um, because there was a lot of just kind of uh, stains from wear and tear and, you know, getting caught in the rain in, in it as well. And so here, as I, I did very similarly with the, uh, the black Chanel piece, um, almost just kind of like puddle cleaning of just kind of uh, very, very gently brushing deionized water um, into those tide lines and getting them to, uh, to reduce and then dry it very, very quickly afterwards. And again, uh, you know, sadly, you just can't walk into, uh, you know, Joanne Fabrics and find kind of silk that is gonna work for, uh, you know, a 1920s um, uh, champagne colored cape. And so lots of lots of dyeing of just kind of dyeing up different colored, um, uh, organzas and taffetas and silk nets, uh, well, the, the nylon nets, um, everything that I really needed for the support um, section of the project. And so here I, um, I have the cape laid out flat and I'm just kind of like starting to really kind of get to grips with um, the support work. 
Um, so I think we have some more details here. So I started off um, with uh, an underlay of the nylon net and um, I actually used uh, an adhesive um, on the net. Um, so almost kind of like creating you know, like a, a, a band-aid or um, because the silk was so brittle, um, the adhesive really helped to uh, hold everything in place. And um, it's a thermoplastic adhesive. Um, so it's cast onto the net, allowed to dry. And then you basically have this film um, and then you reactivate the adhesive using a small heated spatula, which, which we'll see um, in the next couple of slides. And so I'm really kind of like working from the reverse uh, and creating little bridges that just kind of uh, of nets that hold um, all those shards in place. And um, I was also presented with a, a box of little bits. So I was able to kind of, you know, work, uh, do some jigsaw uh, puzzling, which is a uh, very appropriate for this time um, of kind of putting all of that uh, back together again. So once the, uh, the adhesive underlays were in place, I was able then to kind of uh, add the infills um, because you can see there are some pretty spectacular areas of loss there. Um, and so I used uh, this silk organza um, dyed uh, to match. It looks a little darker in, in the photos. It was a, a really good color match. Um, and so those were kind of like laid in and then everything uh, was really then just kind of like stitched um, to the organza. And here you can see on the right, kind of like just the, everything gets tacked down to those to hold it in place. Um, and then once all of that was in place, another layer of uh, the net um, went on top. Um, so this really was a sandwich. I mean, this is probably the worst, um, this is definitely the worst costume piece um, that I have worked on um, in terms of condition. Um, it was certainly a challenging project and um, adhesives tend to be the last, you know, the, the, the last resort option. Um, and you, certainly that was the case with this piece. I mean, there was, there was really no other alternatives that would have worked as well. Um, so section by section, just kind of putting everything back together. Um, here you can see the, uh, the hemline uh, that was missing large areas. Once I started to get everything back together, it then became clear that actually the lining had shrunk when the cape got uh, wet. And so um, the hemline actually didn't fit back together, the front and back. And so we made the decision then to kind of like separate um, the front from the back, just, uh, uh, just so that everything would kind of hang a little bit more naturally um, rather than having the shorter, um, the shorter shrunken lining with a big bag of the, uh, the outer layer of silk around it. And then everything that I just did then had to be done on uh, uh, the smaller scale on, on the wings, uh, just kind of supporting each little patch one by one. Um, so there you can see the progression of patches being inserted underneath, the net going on top, and then the, uh, the finished deal on the right there. Um, again, similar thing to the hemline, just kind of rebuilding um, all of that. Um, this was probably, I think this was a 360-ish hour project. So there was um, a lot of murder podcasts along the way. Um, and here we start to see just kind of uh, some of the aftershots, uh, details of uh, the wings that have been supported. And um, here we have the cape laid flat uh, after conservation. So much more complete, as you can see there. Um, and there's the front. And then uh, here we have it just on uh, kind of the body form that I uh, have here in the studio draped on there. And then there we can see it um, 
uh, in the show uh, right now um, at Hillwood. And uh, they have a companion piece. That red piece is uh, also by the, um, uh, the same designer. Um, it didn't go through a flood, but the silk is, uh, is absolutely pristine, completely, completely different kettle of fish. Um, you know, it's not weighted, perfect conditions. So um, I think uh, obviously this had kind of like inherent condition issues, um, but uh, it probably would have ended up completely shattered anyway, um, despite the uh, despite the flood and the trunk. So um, I think that brings me to the end. So hopefully we have uh, time for a few questions. Oh my God. Well, you weren't kidding when you said that was the project. Yeah, it was rough, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Would everyone please unmute and thank Howard? And unmute, yay. Oh my God. I mean, like my mind is spinning about 360 hours. That was. It was uh, a lot, yes. Yeah. All right, people. Um, so uh, we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. And then if people don't feel like sharing the questions, but want to unmute and um, shout it out, we can, we can take a few questions. Um, but that was really wonderful, Howard. And I think that um, I do have a couple questions, but let's start. Actually, Chris has a question. I'm going to go sort of uh, in reverse order about the Cape from Hell. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we will remember That's you for that forever. It says, from my understanding, mold can develop in humid environments after 48 hours. <coughs> Excuse me. Did you have systems in place to ensure that mold did not develop during its week of humidification? Uh, I did. I did. Uh, my partner was here. <laughs> so... <laughs> He had instructions to check on it basically every day. So um, I was, there was not, um, there was some staining on the cape. Um, there was actually, after I, you know, really examined it um, up close, it turned out to be uh, that the, the, the name label in the back of the cape, the dyes were not fast in that. So um, I was initially worried that that was mold. Um, but uh, it was not, it was just dye movement. Um, but yeah, I mean, here in the studio, um, it's, it's very, very clean. There was no, um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it was kind of like a concern. So I, that's why I left instructions just to check on it every day and, you know, nothing really happened. Um, I have, uh, a uh, an Indian textile right now, an elephant cover um, that uh, the owner um, in Dallas uh, was out of town. He, there was a flood in his apartment and um, it was not found for about a month. And uh, the mold on that was spectacular. And um, that I have been slowly treating, um, it is, uh, currently living in the garage, but um, I've been taking advantage of uh, the beautiful weather that we've been having in Alabama, so it's low humidity. So I've been taking it actually um, outside early morning uh, and just kind of like spraying it with ethanol and kind of cleaning the mold because I just don't want uh, to bring all of that into the studio. But uh, yeah, mold is, is really, really difficult to deal with. No, no, I noticed on the, the photo you showed of it in the gallery that there was a matching dress yes and so the dress did not have any damage on it it was just oh yeah like, yeah, yeah 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 no the, oh. the dress the dress was heavily damaged so um the other conservator worked on the dress and then um was supposed to work on the cape but was like i've had enough with the dress thank you okay All <laughs> right. All right. um okay uh, now, Joanne would like to know, um, did you say you used clean spit on a swab for cleaning the hat? If I yes. heard you correctly, will you explain more? Yes. Spit is actually used fairly commonly um, in conservation because um, it has, um, I mean, and it has to be clean. You can't, you know, uh, 
do it straight after like eating a burger at lunch or whatever. So <laughs> um, it's really great because it contains enzymes. So the, uh, you know, the amylase and protease and things in there actually kind of work really, really well um, on breaking down dirt. So it's used a lot. I mean, it's used a lot in paintings conservation yeah. and um, objects. It works really fantastically well on uh, Native American beadwork. Um, so the trick is kind of like, you know, obviously, you know, you have these enzymes in there that you don't want to leave in place. And so that's why we then go over and clean with uh, the ethanol and, and things like that. Okay. All right. Learned a new trick. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, she said spit clean is a thing. So, um, and Chris would like to know, he's very practical. Uh, in cleaning a stained garment, do you have a special approach to spills from alcoholic beverages? You know, uh, it's tough. That's always, um, I, I, yeah, uh, not really, because a lot of the times, you know, you're, you're kind of drinking and you're having a good time and you don't notice. So I remember, um, a few years ago, um, I was brought a wedding dress. It was a very famous wedding dress. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, it, uh, the designer was actually had asked for it back to go into his archive. Uh, it was a Narcisco Rodriguez dress and um, stunning. But after 20 years, you know, it looked like it was clean and it actually had gone to a dry cleaner in New York who said that they had cleaned it, but um, clearly not particularly well. So it had all of these champagne stains on it that had basically turned orange. And at that point, there was just kind of really nothing that, that I could do. So um, I think the, uh, the key is kind of getting to it early. Okay. All right. Um, we have students with us and um i mean you you've had really terrific training but you know for students that are interested um because it is such a hybrid field i mean you're talking about because because you understand the gravity and what mm -hmm. gravity does on things and capillary action as well as the aesthetics of what needs and and kind of being inventive um, what advice do you have for our students who are interested in pursuing such a path? I think, um, I mean, the key thing is kind of getting uh, all the basics that you need. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I always, I mean, I grew up thinking that I wanted to be a zoologist. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I started to, I was always, I was always, you know, interested, good at art great, but I always loved animals and so um, wanted to do this. And then I found, uh, once I started to, you know, apply to universities and I found that it basically wasn't, you know, just kind of cuddling tiger cubs and washing elephants, I was like, well, I'm less interested now. I don't really want to, you know, dissect, you know, a fish over kind of, you know, a period of six months to study degradation pathways and things like that. But um, so I'd always had kind of like this balance of kind of like the art on one side and uh, science and particularly chemistry on the other. And so um, conservation just kind of, you know, was a, a really great fit. But um, I think, um, you know, the key thing is, and you know, things are so different today um, from when I, you know, was going to school in, in the late nineties in terms of requirements. Um, I think it's just really finding kind of like the right people to talk to about whether, you know, this career would be a fit for you and really what you need to kind of go into it, because it's a lot. I know that, you know, the requirements for some of the courses now are, you know, incredibly, incredibly high in terms of what you need to have on the chemistry side and then work experience from museums and things like that. So, um, it's uh, just making sure that you, uh, you know, really understand what is what is needed. But, um, you know, if it's, it's, I've, you know, really, really enjoyed it. It's, it's definitely been, you know, I mean, I left university 
you know, with a degree in, in constructed textiles, which would have been great in, you know, 1597, uh, you know, as a tapestry weaver, not so great in 1997. So um, this was this, this kind of, um, you know, really made everything fit for me, so. But, you know, as you were talking through actually all the projects, um, but your, the sort of level of patience in detail I mean, that kind of personality that can go to a Zen place. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just, I, you know, also seems to be really important. Um, and I should also let, you know, for everyone that has not seen the Chanel exhibition yet, um, you know, the changes in the garments that Howard worked on, I mean, that the, the black, the black silk velvet with the, the collar was actually uh, made for and worn by Marlena Dietrich. And, um, you know, and it's 1954, it's a really um, wonderful piece. And I remember the first time I pulled it out of the cabinet and it was like, oh, the linen, you know, like, what do we do with that? And it's just, it's such an interesting and important piece the museum has and to not been able to show it. And it looks wonderful in, um, in the gallery and the sh you know the that brocade suit is exquisite so when you come to see it and it just you know the howard how many times do you have to advise a client that i mean i can't believe you told that didn't tell the people that with the cape from hell that like it's beyond repair like how do you have that conversation with somebody or do you ever ah uh... Sometimes, I mean, it's kind of, um, there's always, there's always a hope that things can be, you know, saved. I mean, obviously we, we had that little chat about the Motown Museum before, yeah. um, you know, sometimes there's, there's just nothing that you can do when you're, you know, um, but, uh, but most of the time it's, it's kind of, you know, that's, it's, there's hope and you know you just have to kind of uh, work through the processes and testing and you know sometimes things work sometimes things don't so it's a big part of of what i do um is kind of managing expectations really it's yep. you know I'm not gonna kind of go in there and the whole you know over promise and then under deliver uh, you yep. know definitely the other way around it's like oh this was a nice surprise it turned out great so uh. No, well, we can't thank you enough for sharing uh, a, a part of your world and, and for again, helping the museum be able to show uh, some really important pieces in the collection. I would again ask everyone to join me in unmuting and thanking Howard. It's so hard to do these talks when you see no one. And you know, I know, people, yeah, it is. It you is, don't it hear is people frustrating. giggle, you don't, I was laughing and you know, you don't hear, but. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, we look forward to welcome you here at some point. And to everyone that joined us, um, many, many thanks. And please come see us at the museum soon. And this is recorded, yay, and will be on our YouTube channel on the website. So uh, thank you to Chris Sullivan for making this happen uh, in Jean, Jean's honor. And again, thank you, Howard. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.